Hello creators, how are you guys? It's great to hang out with you again for another Video Creators Podcast episode. My name is Tim Schmoyer and I have been a YouTube creator since 2006 on YouTube. That's over 11 years now and I actually got started by doing what today we call vlogging. Now back then it wasn't called vlogs, it was actually at that time just me and my girlfriend at the time hanging out on dates, going out to the park, going on out to the movies, out to eat and I just brought this little eight millimeter camera along with me to make little videos of us hanging out and uh, since I lived halfway across the country I was doing it so I could take these little videos I posted them to YouTube so I could share my girlfriend with my family back home the other side of the country while I was in graduate school and they could get an opportunity to meet her well we just kept going and our family channel has been uh, through a lot of ups and downs and man we have a learned a lot about vlogging, especially family vlogging. And it's something we, we're starting to take more and more seriously now over the past year and a half or so. And the results have really paid off for us in some pretty big ways, which we're really excited about. But I wanna share with you guys here today is the recording of a consultation I did with a channel called Red Poppy Ranch. Now their story is that they are, they're family vloggers and they're just sharing the story of what it's like, everything they're going through from from buying raw land, about 40 acres I believe, and building a homestead on it. They're, they're clearing land, building it, building a house, completely off grid, all their own water, solar energy and everything. And they're sharing that story, that journey with us on YouTube. If you wanna check them out and follow along with this consultation recording, you can. There's a link in the description of this video on YouTube. Or if you're listening to the podcast audio version in iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, or Google Play, you can find a link to their channel in the show notes of this episode. And I think it would be really helpful for you guys to open up their channel, look at it while I, while I walk through it with them. And this is, as far as I know, as well, I should know, it's my channel, but this is like the most in-depth training I've ever done about vlogging, specifically family vlogging, but vlogging in general about, we're, we're going to get into all sorts of things like storytelling techniques, a lot of time spent on the technical side of YouTube and, and how we create a channel that's subscribable. We talk about uh, how do you start eliciting emotional reactions from your viewers and through the stories that you tell and all that. So I think you guys are going to find this really valuable and it's going to really help you if you do any sort of vlogging, even off of YouTube, whether it's like Instagram stories or Snapchat or anything like this, you're going to find all this to be very helpful for you guys there. So I'm looking forward to doing this with you guys. Feel free to check out their channel. Again, the links below, show notes, description, and I do have their permission to share this with you. So they did a, a paid session with me and I asked if I could record it and share it and they said yes. So here you go. Let's jump into it. So there's a few things we need to talk about here. Um, I don't think we're going to get through all of them, but we'll talk through some of them. Then I'll point you to other resources for the rest. Uh, there's the, the technical aspects of YouTube, which I think we're going to spend most of our time on. Uh, so you have to learn to master that. And then you also, the uh, general, just basic storytelling skills that you need to learn. Then there's the filmmaking production side of all this camera angles and capturing audio and what to show, when to show it, what not to, you know, like all that kind of stuff. Then there's the branding part of all this that communicates who you guys are, what you're all about. And then on YouTube, especially with vlogging, there's also this really important element of like a relational connection to people. Like how do you get them to care about you and your story? And I'll, obviously all these things are intertwined, but to really grow a vlogging channel, it's, it's much harder than it looks because um, the people who do those things well make them seem really natural. And uh, at first it's not going to be natural, but hopefully with a lot of time and practice and things you guys can make them become pretty natural for you guys. So the first thing I want to walk through here um, kind of quickly for the sake of time here for us is when I first came to your channel, uh, what I see here didn't really communicate to me what I ended up learning about you guys as I started watching more and more of your videos. The problem is most people aren't going to take like I did hour, two hours, three hours to start watching your videos and start figuring that kind of stuff out. They're going to come here and they're going to make a quick, I mean, there's plenty of channels and content to watch on YouTube. There's sure. hundred um, uh, hours uploaded every minute. 
So you, you got to stand out really quick. You got like a few seconds to quickly communicate who you guys are, what you're about. Answer those questions people are asking before they subscribe to your channel, which is, is this for me? And do I care about this? Um, do these meaning, these stories have meaning for me that I'm, that connect with me in some way. And so most people subscribe to a YouTube channel on this button right here. And so what I, what I want to walk you through real quickly is how are we going to update this channel page to make it easy for someone to come here and be like, boom, clicking, subscribing. Absolutely. Right. So they know really quickly that this is a channel for them that they want to subscribe to. Okay. Who would you say is the ideal audience you're, you're trying to reach here for this channel? Like who would be your most ideal subscriber be? What's that person like? Probably other family. You know, that's a hard question. Probably other people that have similar interests, I, I guess. That seems to be who we attract, people that, that are on the same road. But at the same time, I think we are starting to attract the younger. I, the more involved my kids are, the more we attract the other family okay. stuff. So. so describe those families to me. Like, and the reason why this is important, because um, in order for someone to quickly like, get into your channel, you have to make them feel quickly like oh, this channel's for me like i this is the kind of content i need this is speaking like connecting with some sort of meaning that i also either believe in or something that's important to me or something i want to aspire to become or or something like i started watching and i started feeling that way myself because i also want to be one day have a good chunk of land that we can do build our family together on um build relationally i mean not build more kids. <laughs> um, but so I started getting that, but I had to dig into it. So just like describe in your mind when you're talking to the camera, who are you talking to? You know, I, I think I'm talking to the people that don't, that, that would love to do what we're doing, but probably aren't going to do what we're doing. Probably it not. seems like a majority of the people that follow us are sitting in a cubicle somewhere all over the world, you know, and they message us and they say, look, we're, you know, it, it takes a tremendous amount of, of uh, stones, I guess, and for lack of a better word, to just even take on what we're doing. And, and part of that's I'm just stupid enough to do it. But, um, but most, I, I, think, I think most people aren't going to buy a completely raw, untouched piece of land that has thousands of trees that need to be dealt with. And do, most, just most people, most people aren't going to do that. They're either going to buy something that's, halfway established or whatever. And so, so here, my, here's my problem. My problem is I've had three or four, really two or three videos take off and the videos that have been done well, they're, they're DIY videos. Mm -hmm. And so it's frustrating with me trying to put my finger on what, what am I? Because I'm a jack of all trades. My background's construction. I do it all. I can do it, at least in my mind. I, I can do everything I need to do to build this place, but I don't want to be a DIY channel. Right. But those are the things that do well. And so it's like, I think, I, I think I'm speaking to the person that has similar interests that, I don't know, is looking to escape some way, I guess, from the mundane. I don't know. Yeah, I think that would be a good conversation to have with your wife and your kids and stuff too. Like when you got, just ask them, when we talk to the camera, who are you picturing in your mind? Who is that person? Who are we trying to connect with? who what because you as you get more into the storytelling elements you have to start crafting your story to highlight the things that th that connect with those people right so it's going to be a different story if you're telling if you're vlogging for someone who is doing it right um as opposed to someone who just wants to do it and will one day as opposed to someone who wants to and never will like those are three different stories so if you got to pick who is this person we really want to reach and and I think you and I might share some similar values in that like for my family and I and our family vlogging channel, we're not interested in growing the biggest channel there is. We're interested in serving a specific group of people the best way that we can. And that is not a very large niche on YouTube. So we will never have a multi-million subscriber vlogging channel, but that's okay. Cause our goal is actually, we're more passionate about about these young moms who feel like they're struggling with one kid, maybe two, like I'm three years old and younger. They used to be a social butterfly in college, but now they're married, their husband's off working, and now they're alone all day, stuck with this thing that just keeps pooping all over them. Right. <laughs> 
what do I do? Like my life is so different. They feel frustrated. They feel tired. They feel drained. They feel discouraged. And so we want to tell stories that help that mom. That's not huge, right? But we get really passionate about telling those stories. So same principle for you guys, like what are their problems? What are their struggles? What do they believe? Um, like what stage of life are they in? Um, everything. So that even give that person a name. I know it's kind of corny and you don't have to do that, but some people find it helpful to like name that person who they're talking to in the camera and then make videos for that person. So. So start with that. And then the second thing though, is after you figure out who this target audience is that you're telling these stories for, the second thing then is you have to know why they should care. Like what's the value you propose to deliver to them through your videos. And people care about family stories when they connect with their own story in some way, when they have some sort of meaning to them. When uh, there's something in there that's like, that's what I want to become, that's who I am. Uh, that's where I'm going, you know, uh, whether, and that's true for all channels, whether it's yours or mine or not, but that's those, those stories need to need to connect with them in, in some sort of way. So, um, that doesn't mean you have to limit yourself just to homesteading videos. Um, knowing who that person is might make it appropriate for you guys to have some marriage stuff in there as well. It might make it appropriate if you have some parenting things too. And, but maybe how it all relates to homesteading in some way. I don't know. It depends on, who you guys decide this is who we're reaching and this is what the difference we want to make in their lives. This is why they should care. Okay. Have you guys thought about that second one a little bit too already or not? Not really. Yeah, for sure. It's How just you guys describe like the value that you're trying to provide. Say again. How would you guys just describe the value that you're trying to provide through your videos and your stories? Well, I think you said it best in the sense that, my feelings are that I've got a select group of people when I, I can throw a video up at two o'clock in the morning and I've got approximately, you know, two to 3000 people that it doesn't matter what I put up there going to watch, which I, I value that. And I guess now I've just got to find a much larger group of those people and they seem to be invested in us as a family and as in individuals. So then the question becomes how, you know, how vulnerable are, are, are we willing to get? It seems to make a difference when people see that side of us that my wife has a really hard time with this. She hates being on camera. This was never her idea, but every time she's on a video, we get more people involved. <laughs> but, but then, you know, she, she chooses to pick through the comments and try and figure out why somebody would say something. And I've, you know, I've learned to, to pretty much ignore the comments other than the, the, the loyal positive followers. So we're just trying to figure out where we're at. Are, are we, I, I think we're a little bit of everything, but we seem to be appealing on some level, you know? And so I guess it's just, I'm just trying to package that without exploiting my kids completely. Right. Exactly. Yeah. I don't want to exploit them, but um, like my wife gets more on board when she knows this is the mission that we're on and YouTube isn't growing a YouTube channel isn't the goal. It's reaching and serving these people the best way we can. Um, that's what gets her excited when she understands that big picture. And then she can take the negative comments better because she sees all the positive ones too. And, and so maybe your wife's the same way. Maybe it's not. But when, when it's like, this is why we're doing this. This is what this is all about. Um, because it'll be easier for her that way. But your wife might be different, but yeah. So without camping on those two things too much, those are two things that you need that will kind of set the whole content strategy for you guys going forward and how you tell and craft these stories and things you put into the, the into the stories, things you decide not to put into the story um, and all those things. So let me go back to your, your channel here. So we have this header image. That's the first place you got to communicate those two things. People will come to your channel. Again, we're optimizing for this button here because of every like one person who subscribes beneath a video, a few hundred will probably subscribe right here. So um, most of, out of these 13,000 subscribers you have, I would say like 13,000 subscribed right here and maybe 600 total on all the other places. So this is where people go. And you can see that in YouTube analytics, just click on subscribers and then turn it into a bar chart and it'll show you exactly where people are subscribing. But, um, so this header image is really important to communicate that. I think it should have a picture of your family, uh, the characters in the story in here. It should tell some sort of story that includes the land. 
Um, now I know you don't have water on your land unless it's that, unless that's that water hole, but, um, from watching your videos, but the, uh, you know, someplace that's on your land and tells a story of like, like, I know you have some pads that have been flattened for, for, for stuff. Maybe that's where you take a picture on right now is like, it's happening and like you're, you're telling the viewer you're joining us in the middle of the story. So that makes sense about the header image. That's a great idea. Thank you. Cool. And then the channel trailer is, I love this. I was like, this is so human right here. Sorry. I didn't like the other trailer. <laughs> uh is is to make a video don't call it channel trailer call it like um welcome to poppy red poppy ranch or something and and this this video did a good job at um you know a lot of pictures of of you guys when you're younger telling it filled in the backstory for me but it didn't really and here, then and this is why i knew your father passed away because that's a part of the story here but, um, and then you guys sitting down and talking a little bit and, and it told me what you guys are up to kind of, but it didn't lead me into the story of who you guys are and what you're all about and what the actual meaning behind it. So if this trailer was less about the land and more about independence and freedom, maybe like that would might be a belief. Like don't tell, talk about what it is, but talk about why it matters. So if it's, is it about independence or, or freedom or what would, what is it about for you guys? Yeah, it, for sure. That's part of it. For sure. Doing things our way, completely separated from any other, you know, necessary, um, you know, process as far as power, water, things like that. Yeah. Okay. So this should, this should uh, go more into the why and the beliefs behind it and, and lead people into it. Like, so they can, they, so that they could jump into any point in your story and understand who you guys are, what you're about and what's going on here and why this matters and things like that. So I would open it up. Um, I would probably open it up that way and by saying something like, I'm just making this up off the top of my head, so I don't use this exactly. But um, you know, one of the things my wife and I believe is that being independent um, and having freedom is one of the most important things that a family can experience together. We didn't always believe that, though. In fact, back when we first met and this thing, you know, we fell in love very quickly, blah, blah, blah. You, you, you kind of tell that story that you told here. And then when my father passed away, that's when we knew, you know, this is really important for us and our family. Something switched. You, t you said something made a difference, but you didn't tell what. You didn't say what happened here. Um, and so now today we bought this land and we're learning to grow on it, working together as a family. Uh, and all these things as we as we build our our house off grid, and we just love to have you guys join that story with us and become a part of what we're doing here. You know, something like that, where it's not just what's happening, but it's the meaning behind what's happening, um, and that will help form the the emotional, the human connection with you guys. That's important. That will um, they'll give you more flexibility in the stories that you tell. So not every story has to be about the land. Now some could just be about, you know, freedom in your marriage. It could be about freedom in growing your kids. It could be about financial freedom. It could be about a lot of different things because you, it's more about the belief that impacts every area of your life rather than just a small part of your life, which is the land and the property. So that makes sense. It does. Thank you. So uh, you, this is a minute, 23 seconds. Uh, I think for a story like that, you could probably get up to a minute. I would try not to go too long because this is for people who aren't yet subscribed. They don't know anything about who you guys are, or at least not much yet, and they're just checking you out. So they're not going to make a huge time investment. So you kind of, okay. you know, don't want to take, you know, 30 minutes to tell all that. Just in a minute for you guys would probably be sufficient. And then write some different text here as the description for that video. Write some text that um, is, uh, you know, welcoming that new person, describing a little bit about who you guys are, big call to action to subscribe, fill in this, this area right here. Oh, and by the way, once your ch channel trailer is done, just like you guys, and most people do this, so I'm not talking to you guys, but when, you, when your video ends, see how it just, it'll, this big red sub subscribe button pops up right here? Uh -huh. So like, don't put an end card on it, which I think we'll talk about here and things like that. Don't do any of that. Just as soon as the video is over, just end it, get right to this red subscribe button and take into consideration the thumbnail image you're using so that this text is, is clearer uh, when it ends. Like maybe have this little bit, side a little bit darker and this side a little bit more, um, like a little bit more uh, 
color so that this text can be read a little bit better. It's not a critical point, but just something I thought I'd point out how the, the, the thumbnail makes it hard to read the text here. Um, one other thing, I'm not going to pick on this isn't going to make or break your channel, but I'll just point it out is that this, this, um, uh, icon you're using for your, for your channel of your family is nice, but it's really, everyone's really small and it's hard to see anyone's faces. People connect with other people when they can see their eyes. If you can see the whites of someone's eyes, that's when people feel like there's a deeper human connection. So this is fine. Like I said, I'm not going to make or break your channel, but a, a more ideal way to, con to just connect with people, like one more opportunity to do that is maybe just have you and your wife in it and have a close up of your faces kind of not smashed together, but close enough together where you can, you can actually see the eyes and feel like there's like a human connection rather than a posed picture that might be on your family wall. Right. And then this next part's important too, as we're moving down the channel, uh, we're just featuring right now your most recent uploads. The problem with this though is that this doesn't tell me much about your channel. And two, you don't know how well these videos convert viewers into subscribers yet because they're new videos. And if the goal of designing this channel page is to get people to click here, then we wanna use some playlists uh, and titles that, that do that. So let me just share, for example, on my channel, what I do is uh, I know most people find my channel because when they're looking for how to do something on YouTube, my first playlist is, look, I've got a lot of how-to trainings here, how to optimize thumbnails, like yesterday, three days ago, one week, two weeks ago. Like I'm showing these people who are first time on my channel, you got here most likely because you're looking for how-to stuff. That's part of this channel. But I know these people are also looking for how to grow a business and how to make money on their channel. That's here too. I know these people also want their videos to rank well and search. Uh, so that's part of here. So you're, you're, the way you, you put these playlists and design them on the front of your channel will also make a big difference in how you communicate uh, to this first time viewer what your channel is all about. And not, you might not necessarily get them to get into that playlist and watch all the videos, but as you guys think through the message behind your stories that you're telling, I would maybe craft a three, four, five playlists that are titled after that, that continue to pitch that value and have a few videos, not a lot. I would say anywhere from six to eight, maybe maximum of 12 videos in each of those uh, so that people could start watching through those videos and if they wanted to and start learning more about who you guys are. One thing you could also consider doing on a vlogging channel is having your first playlist be like new to Red Poppy Ranch, start here. And just have a playlist where you guys kind of a combination of, of videos in that playlist that you analytically can see do a good job at converting viewers into subscribers, but also are just on a gut level, like you just feel like they represent your channel really well. And like this does a good job of telling who we are and what we're all about, even though it doesn't convert that well. So that would probably mean not putting your DIY how-to tutorial videos in that playlist because that's not ultimately where you want to go, even though they might convert well for viewers into subscribers. Um, and then, uh, well, first of all, does that make sense before I kind of move on? Yeah. What's your thoughts on putting, um, words in the thumbnails? Uh, Good question. I actually just had a video yesterday about that, how to optimize it for, for um, the, the, the basic, the breaks is, basic principle it comes down to is for storytelling, like what you guys are doing. Good, strong, clear visuals. Um, work better than a lot of text in the thumbnails. Uh, but more DIY how to tutorial videos tend to do better with text in the thumbnails, provided that the text complements the title in some way rather than just repeat. Okay. All right, so your, uh, your videos here, you know, you're putting text in them and your, your older videos, um, you, know, you can you can use text in a story thumbnail if it's teasing, teasing the, the like if it helps further complement the title. But repeating the title in the thumbnail is not necessary, and especially doesn't read or does read um, that you could enjoy just the title. And instead, like significant discounts on building materials, I would this thumbnail should be. Um, 
picture of some building materials with maybe a dollar sign and a down arrow next to it or something. Okay. That indicates the price went down for these materials. So that's why you're using some text like the dollar sign, but it's it's complement the title. Are you familiar with star, story arcs? Do you know what a story arc is? No, no, not really. Okay, so a story arc is um, like a pattern that stories follow that people really love. So there's a lot of different story arcs. So one pattern that we love in Western society, and it's every time someone tells this, they make a million dollars, is um, the, the underdog who is coming into life with some sort of handicap, some sort of vulnerability, and they meet this, this big challenge and they fail. So that, so, so that would be like they're coming up here and they have a little bit of success. They hit the challenge, but then they come down. That's like, this is the arc we're talking about. So they come down. And then, so think about any superhero movie, Cinderella, any of them, they, they follow this pattern. They go down. Like Cinderella, what, what bigger t- tragedy is there than you know, losing your mother? and having this mean step stepmother and all these mean stepsisters. Um, but then there's this guide that comes along that encourages them, that motivates them to, to step up, whether that's Yoda to Luke Skywalker or that's the fairy godmother to, um, to Cinderella. And they inspire them to step up, to take courage, and they take this big leap of, of courageous action. And sometimes it fails, sometimes it it's a little, has a little bit of success, but the, 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 the main point there is that their character is being tested. And this is where we start to fall in love with the character. Yes, they're human, they fail. Like they had this big moment and they, they, they lost. Like that's what happens to me too in, in real life. Uh, but then there's always a climax where everything like for Cinderella, it's the, she's at the ball, but all of a sudden everything falls apart. You know, she made it, you know? Um, and, uh, and then there's this ultimate climax at the, towards the end of every story where, um, where the, the, they finally overcome the big thing. This is like any, like uh, Spider-Man, Batman, anything. They, they overcome this big thing, this big challenge. And that's when they go to victory. And then, and then the line just kind of goes up on the, on the success scale of that character. So, so that's just like in one story. Um, there's a good video on YouTube called, um, yes, this, the shape of stories. And it's only like four and a half. It's only almost five minutes long, really short. It's, it's by Kurt Vonnet. And I think it's how you say his name, but the, the shape of stories, if you search for it, you'll find it. And he kind of outlines that better than I just did. So, and this is coming back to your channel, but in the storytelling, you know, so every, there's three story arcs to consider for, for your channel. Every video, every, every vlog has its own story arc that it follows. that gets people engaged, that it's building to a climax that they're like, oh, what's happening? So there's, there's that one story arc, but then there, that sits, and this is unique to vlogging. It sits inside a bigger story arc, which is the current the current trial we're going through, the current question mark in everyone's mind, which is, are they going to be able to get water right now? Like that's a story you guys were telling through a lot of videos is like, that would be the a larger uh, story arc. And then that sits inside of a bigger story arc. You can see how this gets complicated really fast. It's not as simple as it looks. A bigger story arc, which is like the entire big picture challenge struggle that you guys are up against which is building this home on this land that you purchased which is completely off grid has has never been uh settled before like that's the big story and then you have the smaller stories and then you have videos does that does that make sense those three yeah it does so to keep people watching you every video you need to consider that that story arc because that's any video could be someone's potentially their first exposure to you guys. So you, need, so you need that video to hook them and then get them to keep watching for this next story arc, which is, are they going to find water? Are they, how are they going to figure this problem out? You know, they have their, their neighbor has a spring, but you know, should they tap into that? Should they not, you know, should they drill a well, all those things that you're trying to figure out. And then, um, and then that gets them then into the bigger story, which is what you're all about. So the come back to your channel now, I would consider telling story, like putting some of those those stories, those the the second tier, into smaller playlists that that people can just jump right into and start experiencing that part of the story. So I'm not doing it perfectly yet on my channel. I'm still learning a lot of this. is way harder than it looks, but I'll show you just an example of how I'm trying it on my family's channel. 
So the first playlist we have here is recent uploads, um, but we quickly get into, and this is just to show that we're, we're an active channel. We're doing this regularly. But here, here's a family road trip to J House Vlogs, which is another family vlogging friends of ours, and family, family reunion. So this is a recent story, uh, one of those shorter story arcs of ours. Another story arc we're going through right now that's several videos is journey to baby number seven arriving this December. And then we have, okay, well here you catch up on our family story. These are all these rewind videos are actually each story arc kind of compressed into like one video, you know, so people can quickly get caught up. Um, they're just clips from all our previous vlogs edited down into one video that um, it's not intended to go big it's just here to help people get caught up real fast on the backstory so here's all of 2016 to catch them up and then kind of catches them up in a few rewind videos and then just a little bit about us we're homeschooling our kids and we're homeschool stuff and then here's our backstory of, of back when dan and i got engaged 11 years ago becoming debt free eight years ago kids six you know so you can fill in the, the backstory a little bit here too. So that's why we recommend doing something like that here. Make, make sense? Any questions about that? That's a great idea. Thank you. All right. Talk about titles and thumbnails a little bit. So I noticed that a lot of your titles are starting with off-grid living. Is there a, a, what what's the thought process be, be, behind starting a lot of them with that? Oh, I, I probably started doing that a year ago and it seemed like those, I, I don't know, it seemed like that had some sort of a, when people would Google maybe off grid living, I don't know what my thought process was okay. on that, but now I feel like I've done it too long to stop, I guess. I don't know. Yeah, it's, it's, um, it's probably unnecessary. Uh, I would, uh, you know, if off grid living is something that's really important to you, you could title your channel after it. Uh, instead of Red Poppy Ranch, but there's nothing wrong with Red Poppy Ranch at all. Um, uh, you could do occasional videos that kind of summarize and kind of here's what off-grid living is like, you know, that type of thing, and make videos about that more accurately hit that, that title. Um, but I feel like we have so many videos that have off-grid living, a few things could potentially happen. Now, it's more complicated than this, but for the sake of the example, you know, you're setting up a lot of these videos to kind of compete with each other since they all kind of start with the same. So if Google's like, should we show this video or that video? It's like, well, all these kind of start the same. And especially since the text starts truncating, you know, on a lot of these, people aren't going to see the actual part of the title. That's like the enticing part of the story. Uh, and so I would suggest not doing that and focusing just on using your title and thumbnail to, to pitch that. Now, to add another layer of consideration to this, I suppose, um, I think that uh, like your channel should have two different buckets of content. When you make a, when you tell a story, there's two different categories it could fall into. The first category I would suggest would be your community content. And that is the stuff where it's, it's, these videos are just intended to go to your subscribers. They're not intended to go big. They're not intended, like the only people who are going to care about this are the people who care about us. Like those two, 3,000 people you said, doesn't matter what you publish, they're going to watch. That's the videos for those people. And then the other bucket, the second bucket is discoverable content. And these are the videos where you're intentionally shooting and crafting them in a way that's designed to get an audience. People have never heard of you before and introduce them to your channel. Your channel right now is very heavy on the community content, except for, that's why the DIY stuff is, is working better for you guys. Like that's just easily searchable stuff. Um, this one, even though it's a story, like this is a good story example of a discoverable video. We bought our homes, our, we bought our off-grid homestead with no mortgage and it's too long, but, and, uh, or credit. Um, you know, that's, that's a good discoverable video. A lot of these are good stories that are discoverable. Um, so if the goal is to grow your channel, I would consider make like where you got, where you're at right now is maybe doing like, <sighs> depends on how aggressively you want to do this, but maybe like 60, 70% discoverable and 40, 30% community. Uh, but again, it depends what your goals are. Like I feel from watching your, your channel, you guys deeply care about your subscribers and the people who are here. 
And uh, so I would not in any way make them feel like you guys don't care about them. You're just trying to grow, but you can still do that. Like even I, I try to do this with, with our, with our families videos where even though I, you know, I have some of these are discoverable. Some of these aren't like, for example, anytime I put the twins in, that's, that's going to be a good video. People just love twins. I don't know why they just do. <laughs> um, or when we're hanging out with this other popular YouTube family, um, they, you know, J house vlogs, you can see those videos are just, those are intended to be discoverable. So I have him in the thumbnail, their logo, you know, her that look like those types of things. But some of these like, um, lessons from 70 years of marriage with Dana's grandparents, that's just for our subscribers. That's not intended to go big. Um, so we still like, instead of using our kids' names, you know, we will still uh, um, say like um, six-year-old drives fast and loves it. That's not our target audience. That's, you know, the people who care more about that video would be more like boys, my son's age. But instead of saying Zeke drives fast, we say six-year-old drives fast so that any six-year-old who sees this can identify with that because they don't know who Zeke is, for example. Uh, so keeping those two buckets in mind, um, and it's really hard to do videos that do both. Once your your channel starts starts getting a lot of traction, um, and you're you're getting like thousand plus you know new subscribers a day because you have this backlog of discoverable content that's performing well for you, then you could probably start switching it to maybe like 50-50. and then you know now you're doing doing like thirty discoverables, you know seventy percent community and then once your channel hits a point where everyone knows about it like you're, you're starting to hit that casey nice that um daily bumps uh type of level where it doesn't matter what you publish you're just gonna get a half million million views easy anyway then you could probably start switching to 100 percent community if you wanted because you're getting so much watch time at that point that you're, you're just gonna get bumped up to the front of everyone's subscription feed anyway because the human connection with you is so high at that point let's see here and then a few other things the two other things regarding the technical side of YouTube is um, um, notes here. So most most of your videos they're not ending with an end screen. You just kind of have like your branded thing come off the end and it ends right here. So are you familiar with end screen elements and cards that get people to click on other? Videos? Yeah, the, the annotations, the end screen annotations. Yeah, not annotations. Technically, not annotations. They're end screen elements, what they're called. Um, like if you go to a, a video and uh, you click on the the down arrow next to it, it's this end screens and annotations. Yeah, but it's not the annotations. It's these actual end screens that you're adding to the video. Yeah, the best reviewer, mm -hmm. yep. newest video, whatever it is. Yeah, I, I would highly recommend you start using some of them, especially given that you have uh, a growing audience. Like your channel is growing. Like, so let's not pretend like it's not. Like you, you're doing well. You're, you're still getting new subscribers every day. There's new people becoming introduced to your story all the time. So um, what these do, if you look in your analytics, these end screens to other videos are the typically on the average channel, they are the most valuable source of watch time from an average view per duration perspective. So if you can get what you are doing, I'm guessing given you know, the hardcore audience that, that you have, they are watching the full video. And if you wanna give Google even more positive signals about your video, you need to extend the viewing session. That is, how does your video contribute to someone's overall viewing session on YouTube? Do they leave YouTube after your video? Do they go and spend another 30 more minutes on YouTube as a result of watching your video? If it's the latter, Google's going to favor your video much higher than someone, a video that's sending them off site or people get bored and they leave the platform. Uh, so if you, if you have these end cards at the end, that would, that would make it, this is a, a really good opportunity that you're kind of missing to extend the viewing session and getting people to watch longer. So uh, what I, the way I do it here, and I do some on other channels too, is I think we saw is, um, while the while the video is uh, wrapping up here, I zoom to a corner and I just have like my other elements next to it. So, what, what editing software do you use? I use Premiere Premiere Pro. The newest one, this CC or which one? Yeah, Creative Cloud. Yep. So, all right, that was one of my questions as well. So I can do that within the um, 
within Premiere. I think that's my issue. I, I had a lot of people complaining when I started using the end screens that they were missing the end of the video. And, yeah. Uh, right. So I would, I would not just artificially, which you're, what you're doing is better than just artificially tacking on a blank 20 seconds onto the end of your video and having some end screens there. You want people to see them while your video is wrapping up. And so that's why I go to a corner while I'm still wrapping up the content and show these around it. Okay. Uh, so you could do that with a different video editor. The other way to do it without spending money on an editor is uh, like this would be a good example of it where you just know your last clip that you're shooting for the vlog when you're wrapping it up. You're just going to keep yourself off to the side so that you leave this side open to put that. There you go. Okay. Yeah, that way you don't have to get like more software and stuff. That's a great idea. Okay. You just keep it in mind then. Shoot the last clip knowing that there's going to be stuff next to you. Do I go the full 15 seconds or do I cut it down to, to I usually cut them down like five seconds to in screen to five seconds? Um, you know, I leave them for the full 20 seconds just because it gives, it pops them up to the viewer um, before they actually like leave because uh, when your end clips are usually like, thank you for watching, not all of them, but some of them, like there's a clear signal that the video is over. So, uh, in that case, I would rather show those end screens as soon as possible. So if it was me, my last clip would be no longer than 20 seconds and I would just wrap everything up in those 20 seconds or less, including if you want someone to comment, if you want them to subscribe, whatever your call to actions are, like you got to wrap it up in that last 20 second clip or less, knowing that that's going to be your final clip and just leave space next to you to add those. So if it's only 15 seconds, great. If you go for 30 seconds, you're going to have 10 seconds where there's going to be no end screens and people are going to know that the video is over because you're starting to do your end stuff. And then they won't see a lot of people abandon the video right away. So they won't even see the end cards at that point. That'll make sense. Uh, it does. Thank you. So start adding using end screens. I think that'd be important. The other thing that gets people to start watching more of your videos, um, by the way, do you have time to keep going? I know we're kind of hitting. Oh, yeah. I got all the time in the world. Okay, cool. So uh, the other thing that's going to make a difference is uh, playlists. And we talked about them a little bit for the front of your channel. Um, but, um, you know, we're talking about adding them down here. But um, adding playlists to, like, is interactive cards on your video. So, like, let's say this whole water thing is one story. You made a playlist about that. And it doesn't have to be a consecutive story. You can have other videos breaking it up. But the playlist is going to be that, that story. So when you make your next video about the water situation, you have a whole playlist. And it's, the playlist isn't titled something like, you know, water situation. It's, it's titled something enticing like you would a video. Like it teases the story. Like... Um, our struggle to find water on barren land. <laughs> it's more of a story than water situation. And so that's the title of the playlist. And then you pop that playlist in as interactive cards. Um, in the video, you're linking to those interactive, those playlists in the descriptions of your videos. And you want to get people into those, in that playlist mode as much as possible so that they, the, the higher um, likelihood of them um, extending the viewing session and watching more of your videos that way as opposed to just kind of like, so for example, whenever we do like a pregnancy update for my wife, um, sometime in that video uh, where, when it's relevant, we plug that card that for that, the interactive card for that playlist journey to baby number seven coming in December. So that people who are watching me for the first time, they can quickly get caught up on that story. So playlists, I would, I would promote those and think of them not as ways of organizing your content as much as you think, I would think about it more about putting sections of videos together that people would want to watch sequentially and extend the viewing session of, and watch time on your channel. And then... Uh, one other thing, so going back to the discoverable stuff, and it sounds like you've kind of already done this a little bit, but I'm going back to discoverable, discoverable things. Um, when you're thinking about telling these stories that, are, that could potentially bring in a new audience, I would recommend going to YouTube and not when you're logged in, but in an incognito window. Do you use Google Chrome? Yeah. Okay. So in Google Chrome, 
you know, just go to an incognito window. So you're logged out and just start doing some searches on YouTube for the different title ideas and story ideas that you have and see what else is out there. What kind of competition are you up against? How are they titling their videos? Um, how are they opening their stories? What types of thumbnails are they using? And um, what's the first 15 seconds of their videos like that's enticing the viewer to want to keep watching uh, that story? Discoverable content is really important that the title and the thumbnail connect really well with the first 15 seconds of the video. A lot of vloggers, they, what they do is they'll, they'll put like uh, an enticing title and thumbnail that doesn't actually happen until eight minutes later in the video. <laughs> And that's fine for your dedicated hardcore subscribers. And if you're like a multi-million subscriber channel with a ton of relational value and equity built with your audience, that can work fine. Cause like you said, it doesn't matter what the title and thumbnail is, they're going to watch it anyway. Uh, but for those new people who never heard of you before, they're going to click on that title and thumbnail with some sort of expectation for the content. And you need to affirm for them right in the very beginning that yes, this is a video about solar panels on patio, on, you know, on patio doors. It can't come at like eight minutes into the video. So that's, that's true for your discoverable content, your community content, you can get away with not doing that as much. But, uh, yeah, so just do some research a little bit and then that'll hopefully f help you fine tune how you maybe open your vlog. So maybe you see that all these videos actually are pointing at the solar panels themselves. And so instead of opening, at, opening with you talking about solar panels, you're gonna open it by pointing at the solar panels, right? Because that's what all the other videos are successful. Okay. Have done. You know what I'm saying? Like, so just do some research before you really shoot and make that whole video so you can shoot it in a way that's more likely for it to succeed. Um, all right, I want to move on to some storytelling stuff here. We're briefly some branding things. Uh, anything else you want to talk about regarding the technical side? Um. I, I think I watched one of Daryl Eve's videos one time. He talked about how uh, the 10 minute video seems to be the Google YouTube for <coughs> preference. Is, is that something I should focus on more? Um, yes and no. And Daryl's absolutely right that there does, there's a few different like milestones that if you can hit these successfully, your channel will do well. And the first one is the 10 minute mark. So yes, but the no part is there's nothing that makes a 10 minute video perform well just because it's 10 minutes. It's if you have a 10 minute video that keeps people watching for 10 minutes, that's, that's the trick. That's the key. Okay. What about my other question was in relation to ads, um, do you do the, the one video I have that's got about 500,000 views? Um, I, I think I put two or three ads in that one because it's I think 17 minutes long and I've gotten nationally gotten some people that that weren't crazy about that and so I guess I'm just trying as far as monetization is concerned what, how far do I go with it uh, it depends on your goals again if the goal is this like cash cow this thing you could do it uh, since your goal is more to grow the subscribership and the viewership, I would not do it. You can look at your YouTube analytics at your audience retention graphs and see if there's a high abandonment at the point where you've placed those ads in, in the midstream ads. And there is a high abandonment, which there naturally will be some, but if it's high, then I would take it out. But if you look at that, you're like, you know what? There's not a lot of abandonment here. It looks like it's doing just fine and you're fine with leaving it in, especially on a video you don't care as much about, then you can leave it in. Okay. But I typically don't do it just because I'm more interested in, I'm not as interested in them in just getting as any little penny I can from everybody. Sure. So uh, the other question that, the other question I struggle with is how many videos a week do I do? Is more content always going to be good? Should I be doing daily videos? I, I maybe do two to three a week right now. Um, there's, there's two ways to answer that question. The first way is to answer that based on what's the best for you and your family. That's the more important way to answer it. The second way to answer it is what's best for YouTube and your viewers. I personally tend to put my family first. And sure. I'm from watching your videos, I know you do as well. So if your family can sustain two or three a week right now, that's what I would do. Um, 
that that comes from, especially if your wife's kind of like iffy anyway, like don't stress her out. Um, make It's better to tell two or three stories a week that are just solid than five or six that are just eh. Okay. So sure. that that's one thing to consider, but from your, from a viewership perspective, um, the more content you're publishing, the more potential opportunity there is for someone to discover you and your channel and to uh, find your stuff and, and become a part of it. Um, so that's, that's important. Um, and then uh, it also keeps viewers coming back every day for your looking for your content. That's important because um, one of the things Google looks for is not just does how much time does someone spend watching your video, but they also look for if we, if we push their video to the homepage, there are people coming back and looking for them. Is this, is their channel was bringing people back to YouTube? And that is like, they really want to feature that. So it'd be more likely to go to the homepage for people when they come back to YouTube, it'll say, um, you'll have your videos featured right there. So I'll, you know, it's, yes. Um, personally, what we do on our family channel is we were doing Monday, Wednesday, Friday, because that was sustainable for us. And that was most important. Um, but now I actually pay an editor. I, I hired someone to edit our family videos and that allowed us to do every weekday. So Monday through Friday, I still don't do Saturdays and Sundays because, you know, we have a Sabbath rest, uh, you know, a day of just, you know, downtime, no work, just family. And we don't do anything like that then. And then we also usually do one day of buffer sometime, which is usually Sunday or something where we're just like getting back into the groove or the kids are going crazy today. We just can't do it today. You know, that type of thing. Uh, so, but that's how we've kind of balanced it, but I can only do that because I pay someone to edit our videos. So does that answer your question? Yeah. Do, uh, is it time for me to graduate to premiere and stop messing around with these, you know, I use windows forever. And then I recently switched over to, I don't know, something I bought online for 50 bucks and I just feel like it's limiting. Oh, they absolutely are. Um, like I, I started with windows movie maker also. Then I went to iMovie when I got a Mac iMovie is a pretty solid program um, and it's included with Mac, but you got to buy the Mac. So I think you're on Windows. So, um, you know, it, uh, eventually. So iMovie? Would it, is iMovie better than maybe not quite taking that leap just yet to Premiere? iMovie is not better than Premiere. Now, Premiere is the professional high level thing that you can do anything with that. That is maximum flexibility. Um, so that, that would be definitely the way to go eventually. Um, I move you, it's a step above the Windows stuff that you're getting. But um, like a, a different editing program, like I would say that's probably one of those things where right now anyway, you're going to put 80% more effort into a result that's going to maybe get you 10 to 20% more results. Yeah. So yes, eventually you're going to want to do that, but probably not quite yet. I would focus more on the storytelling things. Now, as we talk more about these storytelling elements too, though, um, some of them you're going to need to have more sophisticated software in order to cut your story the way that would keep people engaged and watching. Um, so I'll leave that up to you when you make that switch. But what I would really recommend is it's not very user friendly if you just jump into it for the first time and you're coming from like a $50 or a free video editing program as a pretty steep learning curve. And so what I would recommend doing is going to someplace like lynda.com and going through their eight hour um, video course on like Premiere or um, yeah, Premiere Pro Elements, it's called. And in two quick afternoons, you knock it out and it'll teach you everything that you wouldn't have no idea otherwise. Like it's things you wouldn't have discovered on your own. Sure. And force yourself to do it. And after like a week or two, it'll be, you'll be editing them way faster than you would have if you would have stuck with your free program. So the time will pay itself off very quickly. In that. Okay. Um, okay. Let's, any other questions about Technical. No, we're good. Other than cameras, that, that's my other question. I've gone back and forth with cameras. I've had a, you know, a rebel for a little while, but I, I'm one of these guys that I'm flying by the seat of my pants about 99% of the day anyway. I've always got my phone with me. 
I, but the problem with the phone is I, I'm so jerky and so I move around so much. So either I need to get a, get a what's it called, a gimbal or whatever it is or something that, that forces me to slow down or I just need to start packing the camera with me. Yeah. So this is what I use. I didn't plan for this. So it happened to be in my desk. It's a G7X Mark II Canon. It's not cheap. It's like six or $700, but it does have image stabilization built in. If you do image, image stabilization in your editing software, that's when it gets really fuzzy and, and blurry. Um, but this has a little bit of can handshake. And I have a full review of this on my YouTube channel. If you search for it, you can find it. And I'll, I'll show you examples of everything and how it, what it looks like and the recommended settings that I use. Um, but the other thing nice is that it's flip up thing. So you can point yeah. it at yourself and see how you're framing the shot before you hit record. It's not great on focus. It takes a long time. To, to do that sometimes so the autofocus so before you start shooting i usually just hold down the shutter button halfway and that just instantly locks it in the focus um or the other thing i do is i just learn to account for it sometimes i just gotta wait a second or two before i start talking again and then i put this little fuzzy thing on top for the wind so it, it covers up the microphone so that you don't get the like the wind noise in the audio it stills the air around the microphones sensor thing diaphragms so I have two of these actually. My wife has one and I have one so we can vlog separately and put our stuff together when I'm traveling and stuff. Um, the other one that a lot of people recommend for vlogging is the Sony RX100 Mark V. Sony RX100 Mark V. I do not have that one. It's a more expensive camera. It is a little bit smaller. It shoots in 4K. But from what I've heard from people who have it, you can only do up to five minutes in 4K clips and it drains the battery super fast which is not something you want when you're out a lot like i like like you are um but the autofocus on it is tack sharp really fast you know many autofocus problems but the audio on it like on this stuff i don't really have to modify the audio that much but on the rx um 100 mark 5 when i've heard is people have to add a lot of filters and a lot of e equal um equalizers to it to get it to sound right and make it sound full and not just like tinty and hollow so if you're using a free editor that's not gonna work for you you're gonna have to be have a more advanced editor to modify the audio like that um otherwise you know if you're out there for what you're doing you might consider a gopro again the audio is not awesome but it's small it's sturdy you can mount it in all sorts of cool places i've got a few gopros just, just consider doing that, but there's no image stabilization, so that's what you want. Uh, if I were you, I would get either this one or the Sony, and then just get a tripod. Like I have a few of these also, or you can just wrap it around stuff and just like attach it. Now it'll still shake. You can't add it, add, have it to your truck. It's gonna vibrate, you know. But you can still mount it like on top of like trees and pointing down at stuff or high, like, you just wrap it around whatever you want, poles. So, this is okay. Joby Gorilla Pod. Anything else on gear and equipment? No. Cool. You still good to keep going? Yes, sir. All right. Let's do the um, storytelling. I really want you guys to win at this. So. Um, we already talked about story arcs. Look up that video. Um, that'll, that'll explain a lot. Um, uh, and then, so the other thing to consider then is with your, uh, your videos, one of the things that I had a hard time doing when I was watching your videos is uh, it was really hard for me to like jump into your story because each of your stories assumes that the viewer knows all the backstory, and I didn't. You know, So I watched your channel trailer, which helped a little bit, but the first video I'm watching is, is doing the side gig to make more money and breaking down the, the wall. And I was watching it thinking like, well, you know, do they need money? Like what's the financial situation? Are they, uh, is, is he a contractor? Is that what he does? Or like, well, I didn't know what the story is or why you needed a side gig. And so I watched it and there's a lot of time-lapse footage. Uh, one thing to maybe consider with that is, um, uh, 
rather than if you're going to use time lapse footage, um, my editor tells me, Tim, she likes to do a lot of these. She's like, Tim, don't you do time lapse footage unless you're you're trying to make a transition from one scene to the next. Okay. We also have a whole argument about this at VidCon, and then this other person walks up like, Oh yeah, you only do that make a transition. I'm like, Oh, you just blew my <laughs> side. Uh, so, um, but. That's one thing to consider, but, but even because what you're doing, you're talking to the camera, time lapse, talking to the camera. I don't know if your editor allows you to do this, but instead talk for just a second or two and then start showing the time lapse while you're still talking. And that would make your, that would make, that would probably help your audience retention. That would give some people something to listen to rather than just some music, which is nice, but it, it would help the story go a little bit faster, that type of thing. But the overall principle though is not so much that, but it's more like, I need to be able to jump into any of your videos really quick and be brought up to speed a lot more quickly rather than have all these questions, you know. Like, so at the beginning of the video, should I be giving an explanation, a brief explanation on why I'm doing this? I'm over here doing this side job because I have the opportunity to make a couple grand. Yeah. And that money naturally is money we need right now. Something yeah, like that. because I'm working on, like, I'm thinking about drilling this well. And that's going to take all the savings. You said this in one of your other videos. It's going to take all the savings. So as I start watching more videos, it started to come together. But sure. most people aren't going to make that investment. Um, so, uh, and you don't have to, it doesn't have to be a lot. But you can say, like, in case you're new around here, you know, this is what I got to do. This is what we're about. This is what we're trying to do, whatever. And um, it just brought me up to speed. So just consider when you're telling the story, how a new person might perceive this. And if it's a community content, then you're probably not worried about that as much. If it's discoverable, you definitely want to keep that in mind of how you bring people up to speed real quick. Uh, some ways to do that that I've seen people do is um, their, their intro that they do. Uh, like you just have like that overlay image that you use but maybe having like a dedicated three to five second intro that quickly just brings people up to speed on what your channel's all about and, and, and what, what the value is they're gonna get here. Like on video creators, every, I open, I tease every video to affirm for the viewer, like yes, what you clicked is coming in this video. And then it's a three to five second bumper where it just says, um, master YouTube, that's the what, spread your message, that's the why, and then video creators TV. And it's only like three seconds and, it, and everyone kind of quickly knows like, oh, that's what this channel is about. This isn't just a one-off video that he's making um, on this channel, but this is a whole channel about mastering YouTube. So I can spread a message that changes lives. Um, so you could do an intro. Another way to, to consider doing it is more of a storytelling thing. If you think back to like Gilligan's Island and um, think back to the Brady Bunch and think like they all have other, uh, a story. This is a story about a, a boy, a, a man named Jeb, poor mountaineer, barely kept his family fat. You know, they're telling the backstory in that opening before you get into every, any episode. So you know the story before the episode even starts. Um, same with the Brady Bunch, same with uh, Beverly Hills, you know, all those stories, all those episodes start the same way. So, so you don't have to be as forward. So I should do something like that? Yeah, you don't have to be as like forthcoming as that. And you certainly don't want to take 30 seconds like they do. But you could consider making like a branded intro that's shorter, maybe five seconds that kind of quickly brings people up to speed like that. It's a challenge to do, but you know, if you keep boiling it down, keep boiling it down to something you're comfortable with, that might be a way to do it. Um, okay, what else do we got here with storytelling? I, I, I kind of teased head on this a little bit, but um, there's a principle in, in visual storytelling in film that uh, in movies that if there's an opportunity to to show something instead of telling something that you should always show, not tell. That's that's the principle. Show, don't tell. So a lot of your stuff, you're telling me about stuff you're doing. You're telling me about things that you're working on. Um, but most of the time it's you standing and talking about it after the fact. And I think instead, um, if you can just show us instead of telling us, that would be better. And I think that, that what that does for the viewer is it's less about reporting about your day and less about like, like all these status updates throughout your day. Um, instead, it's you're inviting us into the story. Like we're participating, we're experiencing it with you rather than just hearing your thoughts about it afterwards. Uh, so I would see if you can keep that principle in mind. Show, don't tell. Do less reporting and more including the viewer in the story. 
One other little thing that makes a big difference is when you when you vlog and you talk to the camera, look into the view, look into the lens, not at the viewfinder, because this is what makes them feel like you're making eye contact. You know, it's the difference between me looking at you on my screen right now versus when I look up into my camera lens. Now you feel like I'm looking at you. Now you don't, right? So that's that's just a little thing that'll make a big difference too. Um, let me recommend three resources for you that'll get more into the storytelling thing and then the branding thing as well. And go back to that question we talked about earlier about what makes, like how do we tell story around poor content that makes it perform? Well, uh, the storytelling books, and I'm still learning a lot of this stuff myself. I'm really fascinated. I think storytelling is a skill that every creator should just know. Um, whether it's whatever the the content is and it's good for networking it's good for business like who doesn't want to hang out and talk with someone who tells really good stories you know um so uh one of them is a book called long story short the only story guide the only tor the only storytelling guide you'll ever need it's by the author is margo lightman and that's m-a-r-g-o-t and lightman l-e-i-t-m-a-n i actually did a full interview with her it should be published on my channel in the next week or two. Uh, the other one is actually an audio series. It's called The Art of Storytelling from Parents to Professionals. And there's a whole, there's a whole section in there about telling family stories. And it's, the context is not vlogging. The context is just good old-fashioned oral storytelling. But the principles apply. And uh, it's by Professor Hannah B. Harvey. And it's part of the great courses, one of their products. It's like a 13-hour audio series. So while you're out there driving your trucks and stuff, just pop it in and listen to it. Um, and that will help you learn more about how to tell good stories as well. Um, so at the end of the day on YouTube, like people care about stories. And that's going to make the biggest difference from an SEO perspective, from an audience retention perspective, from every way if you get people who love your stories keep coming back to watch more of them watching the full thing like that's going to make the biggest difference and then the other resource is a book that i recommend very often it's called primal branding by patrick hanlon and the reason i recommend this one is because it's not like when people think about branding they normally think about logos and uh, graphics and website design things like that that's a small part of branding. What, what he's talking about in branding is the thing that lets people form an opinion and an emotional connection with you and your product and your music or your whatever it is that you're making. And so what he does is he breaks it down into seven aspects of what he calls the primal code. And he, um, he, um, he looks at all these top brands that develop cult-like followings and he says, what, what are the common elements that these brands have that made it possible and easy for someone to fall in love with their product and their brand? And as you go through it, you'll start, you'll start, the light bulbs will start coming on. You're like, oh, that's why people like that music band. Or that's why that movie is really terrible, but everyone loves it. Or that's why this product is inferior or whatever. And so what I would encourage you and your wife to do, maybe is both of you read it, if, you know, and then sit down together and go through each section, each chapter and be like, okay, first thing is our creation story, which we've talked a little bit about here. How do we, how do we um, introduce people to our backstory better? How do we integrate that into our, into our stories? That's like, that's the necessary. How do, what's our belief? What's our creed? Um, how do we integrate our belief into this? Because um, the most, um, the most passionate and loyal, strongest communities online uh, and in offline in person too. They, they don't revolve around common interests. They actually revolve around shared beliefs. And so that's why religion, politics, you know, things like that are such a big topic because they, they, they reveal beliefs. And, uh, and so how, all that, go through the book, then talk, discuss ways together of how you can maybe integrate those. And the channels that are really killing it on YouTube, they're usually got like five of the seven they're just killing it doing it really well and those maybe not all seven but they've got seven really high so don't feel like you have to force all seven into your content right away just kind of like okay these four make sense we can do this easily and naturally let's just start there and that and that's important the branding side and the human connection side that'll kind of hit both of those okay we've gone through a lot you have any questions or anything else you want to talk through here I guess the last question I would just ask you, I feel like I have so much to do. This probably isn't even relevant right now. 
but I get contacted all the time about YouTube networks and you know, I, most of what they, they you know, other than the, the search engine optimization stuff, most of what they seem to be offering, I just don't know if it's, if I'm ready for it. I don't think so. Um, they make more sense when you become a big major player. You're getting like 20, 30, 40, 50 million views a month. Um, then they can help you more, but it's less as an MCN and it's more as a talent, talent manager, which you could hire on your own if you wanted to at that point, which is why I recommend if you have the skills to run more of the business side of your channel. Um, but yeah, right now they're not, you, it's way better for you to learn the optimization stuff, stuff yourself. Like we've talked about here, some of those things. And, um, yeah, I don't say that blindly. Like I did recommend them from another channel recently, but they had a really unique situation and they were already doing about 12 million views a month and Disney stuff. So I recommended it there, but for you, I, uh, wait till they can give you a more customized deal. Okay. You give me a lot to chew on. Good. Well, hopefully it's been helpful for you. And um, I'm rooting for you guys. I hope this I hope this goes well. And I'm um, looking forward to seeing how you guys how you guys pull this off. And it's not going to be immediate. You know, anything that has to do with forming relationships with viewers online, like relationships just take time, both in real life and online. You know, so it's not going to be like, oh, you know, you're not going to see millions of views tomorrow. But consistently telling good stories over time, like my wife and I have been learning more about storytelling and um, focusing more on that uh, over the past two or three months. Our channel's grown by about 4x um, than what we were doing average before. So, and before that, when we were just telling stories like most people we saw on YouTube, like the big guys who had, but we forgot that they already had so much. Like we talked about so much relational connection with our viewers. I could post anything. Uh, but we started integrating like the title and the thumbnail, first 15 seconds of the story together. That We grew 4X back then too. So these things, that was about a year and a half ago. So it's like each time you keep learning, it's, you know, it's a long, steady journey. But that's the best way to do it too because these flash in the pans, like people will watch for something, but it's not usually a relational connection. And then they're, they're, they have a high volatility on their channel. Or these ones that grow slowly over time are way less volatile, end up having a much stronger audience. Um, they don't lose as much money when AdSense stuff gets all funky and um, they can make money doing other things uh, with their channel as well. So it's more valuable in the long run, which I think you guys understand. Hey. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to hang out with you and look into your channel and get discovered to a, a new channel that I want to watch. And uh, I'm hoping it works out well for you guys. So if you need anything else, just reach out. Nope. I'm good. Thanks again. Connect later. Okay, talk soon. All right, see you, man. All right. I hope that was helpful for you guys. I really want to hear from you in the comments about what really stood out here for you that you're going to do differently now on your channel as a result of listening to this. And then also, what advice, ideas, and suggestions do you have for other family vloggers as they're crafting their channels and growing an audience through the stories that they're telling? I would love to hear from you guys, learn from you guys. You always have really good things to share, and I really do appreciate that. So thank you. And learn from each other. Read the comments. If this is on YouTube, you're watching this, Lots of comments down there you can learn from. If you're listening to the audio podcast, there's I'd love to have you tweet me at Tim Schmoyer or in the show notes, you'll find a link that goes to this audio episode on our website at videocreators.com and you can comment there as well. So looking forward to hanging out with you guys on the comments at both of those places. I also, before we take off, I want to give a huge thank you to those of you who are patrons of mine on patreon.com. You guys are are awesome. You are the one that the ones that make this type of content sustainable for me where I can continue to take time to not just take everything that I've been doing with other people, but be able to take that and, and have the resources to make it accessible for everyone else, including you guys too. So if you're not a patron, I'd love to have you join the awesome community. Every week we're doing private video hangout calls together. We've got a private forum where we're giving each other feedback and sharing ideas and 
and answering questions and all that kind of stuff there as well. And we've got guest expert trainings that we do where a private video call where someone comes in and joins us for one of those private guest experts um, comes and we just hang out and talk with them about a certain topic uh, for an hour or so. And we've got my, my business manager and I, Catherine, we do a monthly uh, a podcast, private podcast just for patrons about the business side of building a YouTube channel and how do you make money on your on your, on your your uh, channel and, and how do you do craft business models and, and make it so it becomes financially sustainable, all that kind of stuff. That's private only for your patrons. So I'd love to have you join us if you're not already, patreon.com slash video creators and subscribe, whether it's your first time here on the channel or did you guys catch that high note? I think my voice cracked when I said subscribe. <laughs> it's late. I need to get to bed. Uh, but yeah, that have you subscribe here on the YouTube channel or uh, iTunes, SoundCloud, Stitcher, Google Play for new podcast episodes every Tuesday. So I look forward to hanging out with you guys then. Subscribe and we'll see you then. Bye.